Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent. I, I apologize right up front. Um, my Spanish is extremely poor, almost non-existent. So I'm going to be speaking and giving my talk in English, and I thank the translators for all of their uh, excellent work. And I also want to thank the organizers of this conference uh, for the invitation to come here and speak with you. They have been wonderfully gracious and wonderfully organized, and it's a true privilege to be here visiting your country. So thank you for having me here. Uh, and also, I recognize that I'm the only thing that stands between you and a good dinner. So let's just go ahead and get started right away. Humor me for just a moment uh, by thinking about a hypothetical question. Imagine you were a space traveler and you came across this planet for the very first time. Don't say it out loud, but think to yourself, what is the thing that would be most striking to you? How many people would say the blue, the water? Yeah, that, that's the answer that I think first comes to people now, people's mind. It is a blue marble. Um, but we know there is probably water on the moon. We know there's water on Mars. There's several other planets in our solar system that have water. And we sent out a single, single Kepler mission that has identified 48 exoplanets within the so-called habitable zone of a sun that probably have liquid water. So if you were fortunate enough to be a space explorer, my guess is you've probably seen a whole bunch of blue marbles before, and this wouldn't be all that spectacular. Some people would say that it's the geologic features, the uh, incredible mountains, like the Andes, uh, the canyons. Uh, but many of our geologists tell us that there's no unique feature of Earth, at least a geologic feature, that is not found on other planets, even our own solar system. And in fact, based on our current knowledge of the universe, there's only one thing that is unique about this planet, and it is life. Uh, and what a spectacular variety of life it is. So ever since the first prokaryotic organisms evolved some 3.6 billion years ago, diversity of life forms on this planet has steadily increased, uh, only punctuated by a handful of mass extinction events. And we know life originated in our oceans, and probably as a result, there are 14 phyla, one of our highest levels of organization that are endemic to the oceans, compared to only one endemic phyla on land. If you take a ship out to our open oceans, they are biological deserts with respect to biodiversity. But if you go to the ocean floor, you go to our coastal shelves, or you go to the coral reefs, they are just teeming with a spectacular variety of life, including things like this isopod, which feeds on the brain of a single species of fish. The specialization and the beauty of marine organisms is perhaps only rivaled by the 400,000 species of angiosperms, the flowering plants who, through their collaboration with insects, have evolved some of the most highly modified body parts of any organisms on the planet. Insects overwhelmingly dominate life on land. Uh, we've described well over a million species of insects. And ever since Linnaeus wrote our modern system of classification back in 1735, we have described an average of 3,500 new species of insect every year. One out of every three species of animal on this planet is a beetle. Uh, in fact, the beetles are so spectacularly diverse that when a reporter asked the famous evolutionary biologist, J.B. Haldane, what all of his years of research had taught him about the existence of a creator, uh, J.B. Helding put back, if a creator exists, it would appear that he has some inordinate fondness for stars and for beetles. Um, at present, we have scientifically described and cataloged roughly around 2 million species of protists, fungi, plants, and animals, and I think there's almost universal agreement among biologists that that represents a trivial fraction of all the life forms that exist on the planet. In fact, some would estimate it only represents about 10% of existing life on Earth, and if that's correct, our estimates for organisms would be somewhere around 10 to perhaps 20 million species on the planet. But you have to keep in mind that that estimate came well before we had the ability to open up the black box of microorganisms. And we now know that if you send a remote operating vehicle down to the ocean floor and you take a sample of a single hydrothermal vent, you can find 56,000 genetically unique life forms of microbes. Given those numbers, I would not be at all shocked if by the time my career ends, we have cataloged and described a million different life forms, 
maybe, maybe 500 million, perhaps more. Uh, it wouldn't shock me even in the slightest. But if all of that spectacular variety of life is the most defining feature of our planet, then as our last speaker showed, loss of this variety of life is one of the most defining features of the modern era. There's good news in that we've only lost about 900 species in the last 400 years, and that means less than 1% of most taxa have gone extinct, so we have time. The bad news is that if all the threatened and endangered go, species go extinct that are currently on the IUCN red list, we're going to be at about 30% species lost in the very near future, and within three to 500 years, we will be at this 75% line that defines a mass extinction. That's bad news. But here's my question to you today. So what? Who cares? Why does it matter how will it affect you if 30% of the world's life forms go extinct? Why will it matter if 75% of the life forms go extinct? Who cares? Well, conservation biologists have, over the years, developed a wide variety of reasons for why we should care about species extinction and why we should try to save these species and the habitats they occupy. They range from ethical and moral, moral reasons to the insurance and options values that species provide, the inspiration and mimicry they provide for solving problems. But the most recent argument that is being developed over the past 10 to 20 years says that diversity may be required to support higher life. It's an idea that was probably most popularized by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which argued repeatedly that the variety of life forms on Earth are crucial to sustaining the basic processes that regulate the productivity and long-term sustainability of ecosystems. The ability of organisms to capture their limiting resources, to produce new tissue, to then decompose that tissue and recycle the biologically essential elements. And it is those four basic processes that underlie all of the goods and all of the services that ecosystems provide to humanity that maintain our well-being and that maintain our prosperity. What I would like to do in my talk today is to discuss the evolution of this relatively new paradigm. It's only been roughly 15 to 20 years that we have repeatedly uh, uh, put forth the argument that biodiversity is required to sustain goods and services of ecosystems. After I can talk about why I think this new idea evolved over the past couple decades, I want to discuss the balance of evidence that supports the view that the variety of life on Earth is required for these supporting services as well as these provisioning and regulating services. I'll ignore the cultural services because at the time much of the work was being done, we didn't have a lot of data on them. Uh, and then, as I end my talk, I want to talk about some challenges that are facing this field as we move it forward and use it to increasingly argue for the conservation of species and some opportunities that exist uh, in places like Peru, particularly if you're a young scientist looking to get involved in this field and make a difference. So let's begin right now with the evolution of this paradigm. If you were to take a look in any introductory textbook in biology, whether it's an ecology textbook, a textbook on evolution, a textbook on biogeography, Biodiversity is almost always plotted on a y-axis, responding to something else. It's responding to latitudinal and elevational gradients. It is responding to changes in biogeochemistry. It is responding to human disturbances. Biologists, ever since Darwin, have thought of biodiversity as simply an epiphenomena of everything else that occurs on the planet. In the 1980s, that viewpoint began to change as a variety of disciplines begin to take species and biodiversity off of the y-axis and put it on an x-axis and say, well, what do species and what does biodiversity actually do to ecosystems as a causal variable? Uh, one of the early fields that began to do this was the field of biological stoichiometry, which argued that organisms have evolved to have certain elemental needs for things like carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So that the species that dominate an ecosystem can drive the whole entire biogeochemistry on elemental cycles as well as fluxes of energy through whole entire ecosystems. And then out came this book by Clive Jones and John Watton in the 1980s, which was a very popular book when I was a graduate student. 
Uh, this furthered the argument that species on an x-axis could change the physics of ecosystems. They could drive the formation of mountain ranges. They could shift streams to become lakes. Uh, they could actually influence the evolution of watersheds. But they drove the physics, not the other way around. And then Schultz and Money came out with the book, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Functioning, where they took a step further and said, well, let's not just think about species and what they do as a causal variable. Let's think about the variety of species and what they do as a causal variable. And there were several visionary chapters in this book that begin to argue that biodiversity may, in fact, regulate nutrient fluxes, cycles, and energy fluxes through whole entire ecosystems. So it was a very exciting time and a new way of thinking where diversity is not an epiphenomenon. It might actually be a driver of many things that we care about. And then in 1992, we had the first Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, where representatives of governments around the world and their scientists got together in Rio de Janeiro and began to take stock of what we are doing to Earth's ecosystems. And one of the products of this Earth Summit was the Global Biodiversity Assessment. And the Global Biodiversity Assessment did a lot of the standard things that we normally do when we assess biodiversity. We assess where it's at, we assess what's happening to it, but there were also several visionary chapters by people like Chris Fields, Hal Mooney, and others that began to say, what will a world be like for humans and humans' well-being if we lose a third to half of all species in the next century? And that question prompted a whole bunch of scientists to run back to their home countries and begin to perform some experiments to answer the question. Let's uh, go back and let's manipulate biodiversity and see what it actually does to ecosystems. Here's three of the early seminal studies, uh, one by Shahid Naeem and the Ecotron in the um, Europe, Dave Tillman's work at Cedar Creek Natural History Reserve in Minnesota, and Andy Hector's collaboration across eight European countries. All of these studies tended to show pretty much the same thing, so I'll just emphasize the work by Dave Tillman initially. So Dave went to the Cedar Creek Natural History area, and he took 24 species of herbaceous plants, and he planted them in different numbers of species in several hundred plots in that reserve. Uh, and over time, we began to observe that the more species that were initially planted in those plots, the more productive the plots would be, the more greenery was in them. And initially, we would measure it as just plant cover because we didn't want to cut everything down and destroy the plots. But over time, we had better measurements showing that net primary production tends to increase in the same manner. Uh, and from plots like this, Dave Tillman would make some fairly broad claims. Uh, here's the one from his seminal, seminal paper. This study provides direct evidence that the current rapid loss of species, not from Minnesota, but on Earth, threatens the productivity of all ecosystems, not just grasslands. And partly because of the over-extrapolations, his work was a bit controversial, but his work was also very controversial uh, because of this graph here on the right. So here, what I'm showing is the rank abundance of the different species in the 24 species plot after just one year of the study. And what you need to keep in mind looking at this plot is that initially we seeded all of these species in equal abundance. So this was a flat line when the experiment began. But after one year, these 24 species plots were overwhelmingly dominated by just a couple of species, namely a species called big blue stem. Uh, and most of these were on their way, it looked like, towards local extinction in the plots. And so this led a lot of people to say that this curve here was not necessarily due to the biodiversity per se. Rather, the curve was due to the fact that as we increased species richness in the plot, we were simply more likely to get these highly productive dominant species. And the implications for conservation were quite different. If Dave Tillman's interpretation was right, we need to conserve all of these species to maintain the productivity of the Minnesota grasslands, maybe the planet. Uh, if the critics were correct, then maybe we just need to focus on these particular species and simply maintain them if we want functions and services in ecosystems. Well, if you take a relatively new exciting question where we're putting species diversity and biodiversity, taking it off of the y-axis and we're sticking it on an x-axis and asking what it does, and when you add to that the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 that said there's a a really critical need to figure out what species diversity does as a causal variable because we're facing very large amounts of extinction. And then you add to that a little bit of controversy from some of these seminal studies. This makes a recipe for an explosion in research. 
Um, back in the late 1990s, it was very hard for you to find a published study looking at how biodiversity affects the goods and services of ecosystems. I stopped counting just a couple of years ago because ISI Web of Science is no longer keeping track because we had, we're off of the Y axis. We're back in 2013. There were almost 700 studies published in that single year looking at how biodiversity affects a good or service. And in fact, this all came from the fact that uh, after this controversy, there was just an army of graduate students all over the world that began to go to their favorite ecosystem with their favorite organism, and they would manipulate the diversity of genes, the diversity of species, or the diversity of functional traits. We would do it in tiny little buckets. Uh, we would do it in field plots. Uh, we would do it in little cages. Uh, and we had it done for microorganisms, vertebrates, plants, and a wide variety of organisms. And by 2009, we had amassed 574 experiments performed with more than 540 different types of organisms. My lab has been instrumental in collating all of this data into a central database that can be used by a wide variety of, of individuals. Uh, and as of roughly 2010, we had more than 1,400 estimates of how biodiversity, usually species richness, affects goods and services and ecosystems. That data set has been used for 14 formal meta-analyses, uh, and what I'd like to do in the second part of my talk is boil down those 14 meta-analyses to simply five points, five things that we've learned over the past decade about what biodiversity does to ecosystem services. The first thing we know, and that we can now say with confidence based on these experiments, is that as a general rule, increasing biodiversity does tend to increase the supporting services of the ecosystems. Uh, some of the early evidence for that uh, came from an analysis that looked at how biodiversity, at least at the extremes, the most diverse polycultures in experiment relative to the monocultures uh, used in those polycultures, uh, and how diversity along the sex axis influences either the production of biomass or the ability of organisms to capture their limiting resources. Um, and the way these were summarized is simply as a log ratio that represents an average diversity effect size. So we compare either biomass production or resource capture in this diverse polyculture to the average of those constituent species when they grow alone. This is the dimensionless ratio. I'm plotting that now on the y-axis here. Anything above zero means that diversity increases either the production of biomass or the efficiency by which organisms capture their limiting resources. On the top graph, I am breaking down the results by different trophic groups. So here we have plants that are capturing inorganic resources and converting it into new plant tissue, herbivores that are capturing plants, converting it to herbivore tissue, predators capturing the prey, etc. These data points represent the mean and 95% confidence intervals across more than 500 experiments. And I want you to notice that with one minor exception, which has a p-value of 0 0.6, 0 0.06, excuse me, all of these are above zero which means across all of the trophic groups we've ever looked at, biodiversity tends to enhance the efficiency by which that group captures its limiting resources and converts it to its own tissue. We've broken it down by different ecosystems. At the closest level, we can compare aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. Again, we almost universally see that diversity enhances these supporting services, and when we break it down into finer gradients of ecosystems, we have rarely found an exception to this general rule. Now, one of the problems with this particular analysis is that we're boiling down diversity just to two levels, the highest level of diversity and the lowest levels of diversity used in experiments. Uh, if we want to get predictive, what we really need to know is what the functional relationship is between diversity and these supporting services of ecosystems. And so there have been about 300 studies that have manipulated species richness continuously across the next axis, to which we can fit a variety of statistical functions ranging from linear relationships through various forms of curvilinear, even saturating relationships. Uh, what we typically find is that species diversity for the different trophic groups tends to increase resource capture, biomass production, or things like decomposition in a positive but decelerating way, uh, a manner that's nonlinear, which suggests that initial losses of species from an ecosystem tend to have comparably small impacts on ecosystem processes 
But as you lose more and more species, the effects get increasingly dramatic as we go from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. We have also resolved uh, a major controversy and found that these diversity effects are driven both by dominant species that are highly productive as well as some form of complementarity among species. And the way we've learned that is that we've stolen a, an equation from evolutionary genetics called the Price Equation. The Price Equation is used to characterize epistasis among genes. So if you look at a phenotype of an organism, the Price Equation asks how much of that phenotype is driven by one dominant gene and how much is driven by interactions among multiple genes. So we've applied the Price Equation from evolutionary genetics to calculate how much of a diversity effect in these experiments is driven by a dominant species and how much is driven by some interaction or complementarity among different species. Um, here's some results that focus simply on the diversity effect for plants as they impact plant biomass. So the y-axis is the grams of plant biomass per square meter in these experiments that is increased in a diverse plot relative to a less diverse plot. Each data point represents one experiment and we're simply ranking the experiments from the highest effects to the lowest effect size. What I want you to notice here is this confidence interval, which says that dominant species increased productivity by 46 to 104 grams per square meter as you increase diversity in these plots. But there is an equal amount of biomass, a confidence interval of 41 to 110 grams per square meter, that is driven by some form of complementarity among species. In other words, dominant species and complementary species tend to explain the same amount of the diversity effect. And when I present this result, I often like to give an analogy to uh, a sports team. So you are not going to win a game, and you're not going to be a great team unless you have a dominant player who can take over and score the majority of your goals. But the dominant player by itself is not going to win some uh, incredible amount of, of games. It's going to have to have defenders, passers, and other people who can step in and, and, and uh, score goals occasionally. And I think nature is very much like this sports team, where nature has some dominant players that account for about 50% of the team's productivity, but it has a suite of complementary players that account for roughly the other half of productivity as well. Um, the third point I want to make, and the next, next thing we've learned, is that the effects of biodiversity on these supporting services of ecosystems rival many other forms of environmental change that seem to dominate our attention in science. I'll give you two examples of this. One comes from work that has been performed by Dave Pullman in the Cedar Creek Natural History area, where he and his colleagues have repeatedly manipulated different forms of environmental change and looked at how they impact the productivity of grasslands. So they have manipulated bioregimes, they've done herbivore exposures, they've added CO2 to simulate climate change, they've simulated drought, they've added nutrients to the atmospheric deposition of nitrogen, and they've manipulated biodiversity. All of these have been done independently using the same species pools. And inevitably what they find is that biodiversity has some of the largest impacts on the productivity of ecosystems compared to any of these other forms of environmental change. This result was generalized by Dave Cooper in a paper published in Nature just a few years ago. Dave Cooper took meta-analyses looking at how all of the different forms of environmental change that we tend to focus on can impact the productivity of ecosystems. These are plotted on the right-hand axis here, so up on the top are the additions of multiple nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus that would eutrophy an ecosystem and increase the productivity of things like lakes or terrestrial environments compared to drought, which tends to decrease the productivity of ecosystems. So we've got a gradient of environmental impacts that range from negative impacts to positive impacts on primary production. Uh, over here on the left-hand side, we have what biodiversity would potentially do to the productivity of ecosystems based on these experiments that we've been talking about. Uh, as biodiversity declines, we get a decline in primary production. This effect is reflected on the y-axis so that you simply can compare it in magnitude to other forms of environmental change. And the key point here is that once we pass roughly a 30% threshold of species loss, we begin to exceed the impacts of acidification, global warming, nutrient additions, and we're up on par with the impact of invasive species and drought on the functioning of ecosystems. 
our university has really substantial impact uh, compared to uh, many of the things we focus on right now. So the first four points focus very heavily on how biodiversity and the variety of life on Earth influence these supporting ecosystem services. Uh, as of a few years ago, there was very little evidence of how biodiversity impacts the provisioning, regulating, or cultural ecosystem services. Uh, and I was invited by the journal Nature to submit a review paper um, just before the Rio Plus 20 conference, the 2012 uh, uh, Earth Summit that was held in Rio de Janeiro, where they asked me to get people together and see if we could figure out what have we learned about biodiversity and its impact on ecosystem services over the last 20 years. As part of that review, I convinced two of the postdocs in my lab, um, Anita Naironi and Patrick Vanille, uh, who naively decided to join me in reviewing 1,700 published studies uh, showing how biodiversity, the variety of genes or species in an ecosystem, can influence provisioning and regulating services. And this is the table that was published in the Nature paper, and I realize it's complex, but I'm going to explain it in just a moment. The take-home message is that there's pretty good evidence that biodiversity does tend to enhance many of the provisioning and regulating services of ecosystems and what those provide to society. So what we have here are the provisioning services for which we could find data, uh, the production of crops, yield of fisheries, production of wood and forest, fodder production and grasslands, uh, and regulating services like biocontrol, climate regulation, soil, soil formation, water purification, etc. Uh, this here is the level of diversity that is potentially providing the service, whether it's a genetic diversity or species diversity. This is the group of organisms providing it, plants versus uh, natural enemies uh, versus mixed groups of organisms. And then over here at right is what we predicted a priori. So for instance, we had predicted that genetic diversity of plants would enhance crop yield before we ever went into the data. This is the amount of data that we found, the number of studies, whether they came from experiments or observations, and whether the balance of evidence, 75% of the more of the studies, supported our a priori prediction. So everything here in green means that our a priori prediction about how diversity should change a good or service is well supported by the existing literature. Now you will notice that there are some that have mixed data. We can't back up some of the claims that have been made. Maybe some of our claims are incorrect. And here's a great opportunity because 36% of the goods and services we studied have no data. But at present, 40% of the goods and services that we have data for show that biodiversity actually does exactly what we had hoped it does in providing humanity with that good or service. Let me give you a few examples of things that we know are pretty concrete. And I want to emphasize before I do so that for several of these services, we have really large sample sizes. So we have hundreds of studies, independent experiments that are typically in agreement. And not only that, but in many cases, we have not only experiments where we have manipulated diversity to see what it does, but we have observational studies that correspond and give us the same answer in unmanipulated real systems. And so what we know, and I think we can say with confidence now, is that biodiversity helps speed the formation of fertile organic soils. We know that biodiversity, at least at the level of genetic diversity, tends to enhance crop yield. Uh, we don't have the same results for species diversity yet, um, but those data are still pending. Uh, we know that increasing the biodiversity of plants tends to reduce the prevalence of viral and bacterial-borne plant diseases that ruin our crops and that attack our forests. Welcome to consider with confidence that increasing diversity of plants tends to decrease the probability that an invasive species can get established and proliferate in an ecosystem. This was a surprise to me. We know that diverse forests that have a greater variety of tree species produce more total wood across the whole forest. And I'll give you an example in a while that shows it's a pretty substantial amount. And then lastly, we have some observational data from the world's oceans that suggest that oceans that have a greater variety of fish species tend to have a greater stability of catches, or in other words, a lower variability of fish yields through time. And presumably that occurs because when one fish species becomes overfished and is drawn down to low abundances, the fishermen can switch to another fish while that other one recovers. So the yields are more stable for people's livelihoods. So, the balance of evidence so far 
makes it very clear that the variety of life on Earth, at least in the ecosystems that have been studied to date, are crucial for maintaining these supporting services of ecosystems. We are beginning to amass data that suggests that biodiversity is critical for certain provisioning and regulating services, although the data sets are certainly incomplete. And we need a lot more work on this particular topic. Uh, but I think we do have a sufficient amount of data to move forward uh, in claiming to the public and claiming to politicians that a good reason to conserve biodiversity is because it affects human well-being through the provisioning of ecosystem services. But what I want to do right now in the final part of the talk is discuss some of the challenges that we're facing in this particular field. And there are many challenges, but I'm only going to discuss three. And I want to use those challenges to highlight opportunities that exist for some of the young people that might be excited about this topic and want to take this field forward as we begin to justify conservation on the basis of ecosystem services. The first challenge that I see in this field, and that I believe is really important, is that we've got to get from our obsession of small-scale patterns and experiments to actually predict the consequences of species loss in real ecosystems that we hope to manage or conserve. So we now have just hundreds, if not, we're well, approaching a thousand experiments that are all performed on relatively small scales. I think the largest one's probably about as big as this room. And we are using those to make inferences about how diversity loss is going to impact the functioning and the goods and services of whole ecosystems. But what we really care about is the consequences of species extinction from a national park, from an island, from a lake, from a scale that is something that we tend to manage. And importantly, we also care about the fact that extinction very often influences many different things at once. These ecosystems provide people with multiple goods and services, and our experiments so far have been obsessed with a relatively small number, often just one function or service at a time. So how do we get from the small-scale experiments that often focus on a relatively small number of things to begin to predict the consequences of extinction at whole ecosystems where we want to manage multiple goods and services? We've got a long way to go. This is a real opportunity for somebody who wants to get involved in this field uh, but I want to give you some inclination that there's hope and that we are making progress and that it can be done. So one approach that we're taking in my lab is to begin to develop scaling relationships using the experiments that have been performed to date. Um, I would argue that we're never going to make biodiversity at the scale of a national park, a whole entire island, or a whole entire lake. So the best we can do is use the experiments to guide some inferences if we want to extrapolate to larger scales. And here's how we do it. This graph shows the time scale of all the different experiments that have been performed to date. So it's the duration of the experiment divided by the generation time of the focal organisms. This is the spatial scale at which the experiments have been performed, the, the extent of the study system divided by the body size of the organism. Each dot represents an individual experiment that has been performed to date. Green represents the plants with the mean. Uh, the um, brown represents the tritivores. Uh, the red represents predators, and the blue represents herbivores. This box is the 95% confidence interval uh, at which we have manipulated biodiversity to date in experiments. And just for reference, I've plotted up some different species extinctions we might care to predict the consequences of at larger scales. This is wolves from Yellowstone National Park in North America, flightless birds from islands in New Zealand, trouts or clams from rivers and lakes, uh, even butterflies from the whole entire continent. So you can see there's a bit of a mismatch between the scales at which we've done experiments and the scales where we want to make predictions. But also note, if you will, the fact that experiments span about eight um, orders of magnitude along the x-axis of time scale and 15 orders of magnitude along the y-axis of spatial scale. So here's what we do if we wanted to develop scaling relationships. Down here, for every single experiment, we know how biodiversity, something like species richness, affects the change in a function or a service relative to a monoculture. And we've been able to characterize the parameters A and B that tell us what is the maximum amount of function you could have for an infinite number of species and the half saturation constant. This equation can be algebraically rearranged to the one on the right, where we can predict for any experiment the fraction of species that you have in the ecosystem that must be conserved if you want to maintain theta percentage of the maximum theoretical service. 
Then, using all of the spatial and temporal variation in these studies, we can look at how these parameter values change as a function of the time scale of the experiments or the spatial scale of the experiments. And if you're willing to assume that biology remains constant from experiments to the real world, and that's something we're constantly working to verify, you can use these scaling coefficients to predict from this box to slightly larger ecosystems. Let me throw some numbers at you just to show what this uh, gives us in the end. The typical grassland in the Northern Hemisphere, whether it comes from China, North America, or Europe, contains about 200 species of herbaceous vegetation. And if you're willing to buy these extrapolated scaling relationships, they would predict that if you want to maintain 80% of the maximum productivity in a grassland, you would need to conserve about 65% of those species. If you want to maintain 80% of the productivity of a typical deciduous forest in Europe or North America, you would have to maintain and conserve about 76% of the species. And if you want to maintain oxygen production in a lake so that it doesn't become hypoxic, you would have to maintain about 68% of the 80 species of algae that are typically found in lakes across the world. Don't believe these numbers. They're not meant to be used for real conservation efforts. There's a wide variety of problems with them. Uh, one, obviously we're extrapolating, so there's a risk of that. What we need to do is now get in the field and figure out whether or not these numbers are verified by real data as we survey across real lakes, real grasslands, and if we get the same numbers uh, from real data. We're constantly working to do that. Uh, and once we can match up our observational data to these extrapolations, we'll know that we're onto something. But there's a second problem and a second reason that you shouldn't trust them. They focus only on one ecosystem service, productivity. What we often want in ecosystems is to balance multiple ecosystem services, and sometimes those services have trade-offs, where as one goes up, one has to decline. And here's the good news. People are making progress on that as well. Uh, the top represents a paper from Jarrett Burns that I want to promote because I think it is uh, basically set the stage for how we statistically go about measuring the impacts of biodiversity on multiple goods and services of ecosystems, particularly when those uh, goods and services exhibit trade-offs to one another. And importantly, Jarrett published the R code for the statistics so that anybody can now download R, which is a free shareware program, analyze their data, and have a standard way, uh, which I think is probably the best way we have available now for analyzing the multifunctionality of ecosystems. The first person to take that R code and apply it to real data was Jonathan Lefchek, who published a paper in Nature Communications last year. Jonathan took 94 experiments that were published in the data set that we've amassed, where the authors have measured anywhere from two ecosystem services up to 12 ecosystem services. And I simply want to illustrate the kind of information that we can get out of these analyses. Jonathan calculated how many species we need to maintain anywhere between two and 12 ecosystem services simultaneously across thresholds that range from you wanting 100% of those services at their maximum value that we've seen from any monoculture in that ecosystem to 75% of that max to 50% of the max to 25 and so on. Now, because many of these ecosystem services exist with a trade-off, it's not possible for diversity to maximize all of them simultaneously. Uh, in fact, you can always find a single species that can do it better than a diverse community if you only want one thing. But if you want multiple things, this technique allows you to find the optimum, or where the trade-offs are maximized. And what we know is here is where you can maintain 12 ecosystem services represented by the red line, and you can maintain them at 81% of all of their maximum values, so long as you have 40 or more species in the ecosystem. Here's what I think is impressive about this. And again, you shouldn't take these numbers too literally, and they're not ready to be used for conservation. But we have a field of study in biodiversity and ecosystem services whose genesis was only about 20 years ago. And in 20 years, we've gone from just repeatedly documenting patterns of how diversity affects goods and services and experiments to a field that's becoming quantitative and predictive, where we can tell you how many species it takes to produce X number of different services and do it at a particular threshold value. And this work has since been extended to look at how turnover of species across years or across spatial locations might increase the number of species you need to conserve. 
I think this is wonderful progress for a field that is not very old. And if you are quantitatively inclined and you want to get involved, this is an outstanding area for you to help develop as a young new scientist. The second area, challenge that I think we face, uh, but also represents a grand opportunity, is converting the ecosystem services that are measured by your typical ecologist into something that actually has human value. I, I don't know what your experience is, but my experience in working with ecologists is that we measure a wide variety of things that are fairly easy for us to measure. And I often find when we go talk to social scientists, the social scientists say, well, that's not actually what people care about. You should have been measuring something different. And perhaps because our natural scientists that are doing these experiments haven't worked very well with our social scientists that could translate them to humanity, I could count from you on one hand the number of studies that have calculated the marginal value of species diversity for a good or service that an ecosystem provides to humanity. Again, that's a bit disappointing, but it also represents a golden opportunity for young scientists who are good at working at the interface of natural and social sciences and I want to present, present to you one example that shows that we can do it. It's actually not that hard when we get the right people involved. And I want to use this one example as some inspiration to show that we can calculate the marginal value of species diversity for things we care about. And this particular example comes from an argument that biodiversity is potentially useful for offsetting climate change by sucking up and sequestering a lot of carbon dioxide and enhancing its storage in ecosystems. Um, and anybody who is a carbon model or a climate change scientist knows that as plants sequester CO2 from the atmosphere and increase their biomass, that short-term sequestration is not necessarily what we care about for climate change because the majority of that biomass gets eaten by herbivores or is very quickly decomposed and the carbon is recycled back into the atmosphere. It represents a very short-term storage. Instead, what we want is long-term storage that gets down here in the soil into refractory um, carbon, like lignin, that can't be de decomposed and that will stay there for decades to millennia. Bruce Hungate is a climate change modeler who specializes in carbon modeling and budgets. Uh, he works at uh, Northern Arizona State University uh, and he has been taking the data sets that we've amassed uh, over this uh, some amount of time and has been converting them into refractory detrital biomass and then calculating the value of biodiversity for carbon storage through time. Uh, and go through a sequence of five equations, and I'll just quickly go through them to illustrate the process. So we know what this equation is from the experiments. We know how species richness of plants impacts the biomass of plants. Uh, we have pretty good estimates that say some constant fraction of that biomass is carbon, and we know what that is for most trees. We know that it, what that is for many herbaceous vegetation. And then we know that if we have this initial amount of carbon, we can project how much of that decomposes and gets recycled back to the atmosphere because we have good coefficients of decomposition for wood and for most herbaceous plant species. And so if you know how much is there initially and you know how much this decomposes, you can calculate the marginal value of biodiversity over any time period that you wish to estimate. In this case, we go out for five decades because that tends to be relevant both to politicians as well as climate change modelers. So we can calculate the change in carbon storage down here in refractory detrital mass per species in the ecosystem, and then we multiply that by the social value of carbon. There is a market for carbon where there's a current cost per ton of carbon, and you multiply that by a discount rate, sum it up over 50 years, and you've got the value of species, or in turn the value of biodiversity for carbon storage in ecosystems. And so here's the kind of numbers we get. On the left-hand axis, we have the size of the carbon pool that is stored uh, either in the plants, it actually gets down in the soil, this is what we care about, or the total amount in the ecosystem. This is the marginal carbon storage per species and tons of carbon per hectare per species. It is decelerating. If you multiply these curves by the social value of carbon and the discount rate, we get numbers like this. In fourth, the first three species are worth $37,000 per hectare on the carbon market. After that, an additional 15 species only gives you an additional $54,000, but that's largely because these are decelerating curves. Grasslands don't store as much carbon, so these values are lower, but the curve is still pretty much the same. These numbers wind up being considerably lower than I would have guessed. Uh, and they're lower not because diversity is not important, they're lower because the cost of carbon is low. But if 
Governments were to begin to value payments for ecosystem services to offset climate change, and carbon was to go up in price. These numbers could get quite substantial and might actually be used to value uh, conservation efforts. I want to end the talk on um, one more opportunity and one more challenge we face. Uh, and this is broadening our skills of inference to actually cover the planet and the planet's biodiversity. I think if we care about biodiversity and the services it provides, at least at a global scale, um, there is a latitudinal band. And that band spans the tropics down here in South America and Africa and Indonesia, where the majority of the wild species reside, and where the majority of the Earth's primary production and the majority of the density of carbon happens to be stored. But guess where biodiversity experiments have been performed? I think it's a lot like most other forms of biodiversity science. Uh, it's funded by North American countries, Canada and the U.S. predominantly, as well as by the European Union. Uh, South America is represented with a number of studies in Argentina, uh, as well as Chile and Brazil. Uh, but by and large, this latitudinal band is completely missing. This is discouraging. This is actually a little embarrassing. I, I think funding agencies should be embarrassed by this. I think many scientists in some of these well-developed countries should be embarrassed by this. Uh, we're ex over-extrapolating our conclusions about biodiversity in the world's ecosystem services from areas that represent some of the simplest, lowest diversity ecosystems on the planet. But we're doing all the low-hanging fruit. It's now time for us to study the more complex systems and the more difficult systems, but the ones that are also more important to us. And we need to move into those tropical forests. And I'm convinced that the first young scientist that wants to do that massive experiment of biodiversity with the thousands of species of trees in the tropics is going to have a sequence of nature papers and a um, highly esteemed career if they could pull it off. Um, but there are real challenges. The, the costs could be astronomical. The experimental designs to manipulate that species, those different species could be off the charts. There's going to be some real challenges to people that want to do that. So I think we have to take some other routes. And I'll just mention two in closing. Um, this is a paper published by Dan Bunker, Shahid Nayim, and a group of authors from uh, NC's working group. Uh, they looked at how tree diversity in Panama impacts carbon storage in Panamanian forests. And they did it largely through simulations and modeling, where they took the existing species pool, they knew the abundance of the different species, they knew the traits of the different species in terms of the amount of biomass wrapped up in carbon, they made some assumptions about how species were going to go extinct. Were they going to go extinct at random? Were the most widespread species going to go extinct? Were the species that were the rarest? Were the largest going to go extinct first? And in what order? And then they made some assumptions about whether the remaining tree species were going to compensate and, and fill in the gaps that were going to be left by those extinctions. And from those, they could come up with some simulations and modeling that made predictions about how tree diversity was going to impact carbon storage in different Panamanian forests. This is largely a data-free exercise, but it does set up some very nice predictions where we could use observational studies with statistical controls to figure out which of these scenarios is correct. This is one of my favorite papers that have done that. It's a paper by Elaine Paquette, Christian Messier, who analyzed data from 10,000 plots that have been monitored by the Canadian Forest Service for the last 50 years. And what Elaine did is they looked at how the productivity of wood in these forests was influenced by the richness of tree species as well as the functional di uh, uh, diversity of the tree species. But they did start looking at the residuals after controlling for all of the other things that we know affect wood production. We know wood production is affected by temperature, by precipitation, by soil nutrient conditions, by how age old the sand is and how long since it's been logged. And so after statistically controlling for those things, they found that Species diversity and functional diversity could explain 40% of the wood production in the average stand in Canada. Think about that. 40%. If you are a climate change modeler and you are missing 40% of the carbon going into wood because you're not accounting for biodiversity, you have a huge missing sea source. I think we can use these types of studies 
to complement that one or two experiments that we might convince your governments to run in the tropics. We need one or two massive biodiversity experiments in the tropics that will immediately become famous, but we can complement them with simulations, modeling, and observational studies that are much more realistic in these highly complex, diverse systems. And I'm excited that we might be able to do that in the future. All right, let me end now. There are a wide variety of reasons why we need to be concerned about this pending extinction event. The latest argument why we need to be concerned about it is that ecosystems and the wide variety of life they contain provide humanity with goods and services that are critical not only to our own survival, but are critical to our well-being and that are critical to our prosperity. I'm showing you that there's really good data amassing now that biodiversity controls these supporting services of ecosystems. There is emerging evidence that it controls and regulates these provisioning and regulating services that are important to people. And I've outlined three directions that I think we need to go, particularly with junior researchers and particularly in the tropics, if this field is going to stay on the map and influence the way we do conservation in the future. But as we head down that direction, I want to end with one important warning and one important caveat. And it's a warning I always give to my students. It's a warning that I give to everybody who takes my class on ecosystem services at the University of Michigan. And it is that ecosystem services and putting a value on nature is but one tool in the conservation box. It does not replace the other reasons for conservation. Clarkson Daly said it best. She has a quote in her famous book that says, just as it would be absurd to calculate the full value of a human being on the basis of his or her wage-earning potential, there exists no absolute value of an ecosystem service waiting to be discovered and revealed to the world by a member of the intellectual community. Thank you for your time.